All right, hello everyone. My name is Alex Welsh. I'm one of the founders here at Malachite Technologies and I head up the process integration team. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about a large area microwave plasma source arrays for ion assisted sputtering of DLC and other surface modifications. Now this presentation uh, was done in collaboration with our partner, Serum Microwave, who provided the generator and plasma sources for the work, along with some of the data. I'll start with a little bit of an intro to our company. So we're located here in San Francisco, California. Uh, being in Silicon Valley, we have an experienced team, a staff of engineers of all flavors, uh, primarily experienced in the art of thin film deposition, plasma processing, and both the process and the hardware integration that goes along with that. So through our partnership with Serum, we are the North American Applications Lab, the sales support team for them. And as part of that, we are continuing to develop new applications for their plasma sources and new uh, integration methods for a lot of their traditional microwave equipment. I'll talk briefly about that. But uh, our, our business really um, has multiple facets. I think one of the areas for us is really uh, as a provider of engineering services in the high-tech industries that I described. Um, we work with all kinds of organizations and really are able to provide custom research, um, both from a process and equipment tool set to help uh, organizations take ideas that they're developing at the R&D scale and start to scale them up, both in the pilot and production scale. So, um, you know, on the right here, we have a few pictures of some of our equipment. We have a couple of confocal PVD systems. We have a horizontal inline sputter system. And the bottom right there is a, a system that we recently built, um, which was a, it's a high pressure microwave reactor. So that's basically a, a waveguide that can be pressurized to 1,000 PSI and heat materials at 1,000 degrees. So it's a little bit um, maybe out of scope for this conference, but I think it's a, a good example of our capability. So let's get right into it. Um, so Serum has developed both the, the generator and the plasma source side that I'm gonna be talking about today. On the generator side, there's been this sort of resurgence of microwave research with the advent of solid state generators. So in particular, Serum has a 2.45 gigahertz output solid state microwave generator. Uh, there's a 200 watt and a 450 watt configuration. And there's actually also now a one kilowatt configuration. And these are really powerful research tools. Um, they have one watt power increment control and it can, can output all the way down to one watt. They use a coaxial output and they have built-in tuning and protection circuits. So it really simplifies the, the hardware. And you know, traditionally, a uh, microwave system would require quite a bit of hardware in terms of the waveguide and the tuning components. But in these solid state designs, uh, basically all of that has been built into the board. So it really simplifies and um, makes it a powerful research tool. Um, in terms of the plasma sources that Serum's developed, there's, there's two configurations. We have the aura wave and the high wave. They're fairly similar in that they're both powered by the solid state generator. They both have a coaxial input and they mount to a chamber or a processing system on a KF40 flange. The difference is really that the aura wave is an ECR style source. So there's a small magnet at the, the tip of this nose here and it operates in a lower pressure regime. So typically, I would say typically in the one to 10 millitor range, um, it can go a little bit beyond that as well. And then there's the high wave source, which doesn't have any magnets built into it and it's uh, treated as more of a collisional plasma source. So that can operate at higher pressure. Either way, both of these sources um, are very high density. And I'll take a look at some of the measurements that Serum has done to demonstrate the plasma density that these are able to create. So one of the things that Serum has done uh, and built recently is this system. So the power of these sources is that each one is powered by its own generator. And you basically get independent control over each plasma source. So as an example of maybe an extreme of that, Serum has built this system, which has 25 of them. You can see the chamber here on, in the lid with 25 in a five by five array. And all of these black cables here are the coaxial cables going to their respective uh, power sources. The little schematic here in the bottom right shows an overview of the, the spacing. So they're about 90 millimeters apart. And there's enough ports here so you can have a full five by five array. 
And then what they did was they uh, used the Langmuir probe and characterized the plasma density. Um, and they characterized it against gas type and pressure and in terms of the distance and looked at and, and looked at how the, the configuration of this array functions. Now these pictures again show the, the system installed at, at CERM at CERM's facility and then also a picture through the viewport and this plasma I believe is an oxygen plasma and you can see all the sources are lit up and um, independently powered by their own microwave generator. So let's start with just a single source. So in the picture on the left here, you can see the setup. We have a plasma source at the top of the chamber. You can see this long extension here is the Langmuir probe reaching in just below it. And then we're gonna look at the plasma density as a function of power and pressure and as a function of distance. So there's a lot of research that's gone into this and there's much more, many more complete reports available. So I feel like if, um, you know, I'm just gonna touch on a few of the highlights, but uh, as people, learn about these sources and learn about this work, uh, feel free to reach out and there's plenty more information to share. But for the moment, if you look at a single source, these, these color maps here look at the plasma density as a function of pressure and power. So for the aura wave, you can see that at about two Pascal and above 250 Watts, we start to get in this high density region, which um, is in the 10 to the 10 uh, per cubic centimeter plasma density. The high wave, for a comparison, operates at a little bit higher pressure. So here the maximum plasma density is around 10 Pascal and a little bit higher pressure, I'm sorry, a little bit higher power. But you can see now we're in the 10 to the 11 regime. So you know it really depends on your application um, in terms of what you're trying to achieve. But these two sources um, will cover a pretty wide pressure range, at least in, in the low pressure um, environment. When we start to put them together, um, we can look at how big of a uniformity we, um, uniform region we can get. So this is an example of a four by four array. And you can see, so here's the array of sources, these black X's. And then the Langmuir probe is scanning along the length of this and looking at what the uniformity is. So this is at a 10 centimeter distance from the source plane to where the probe tip is. And then a distance along, uh, I would say, the x-axis or the z-axis uh, of this chamber lid. And you can see that over a 360 millimeter length, we're able to get 2% uniformity. It's excellent. It's really good. And so you can imagine that if you're trying to do, for example, a 300 millimeter silicon wafer or something of that type, you could easily get excellent uniformity. On, on the right here, this is, again, a slightly different distance. So here we're at 14 centimeters, so a little bit farther away. And the uniformity is even better. So here we got 2% again over that 360 range. But if we look at the wider band of 440 millimeters, we're at 5%. So again, you can really expand the uniformity region um, in a few different ways. I would also note that the way this is set up, uh, again, remind, I can remind you that each one of these plasma sources is powered by its own generator. So in this setup, the outer ring, the outer edge of peripheral sources were set at 400 watts each, and the center ones were at 50. So being able to balance the power locally allows you to tune this uniformity, right? So you can imagine uh, it's a powerful tool when you're trying to get um, really precise treatments and coatings. If we look at another configuration, um, this is where we say, let's imagine these sources are uh, are arranged in a, in a linear array. So here at the upper right corner, you can see I have six sources all in a row. And then I'm looking at the uniformity of that. So the other thing to point out in this slide is that there's been a lot of uh, modeling capability now because we have direct measurements of the source. We can now model what the plasma sources will do before actually building any hardware. So here's the simulation on the left, which shows that for a given width of 470 millimeters, you have six sources, you can get easily 5% uniformity. Now, when we went and actually did the measurements, or when I should, should say when Sarah went and did the measurements, um, found that uh, it was about, you know, it was very close to the simulated model, both in the plasma density and in the uniformity. And you can see that, again, here we have at the outer edges, these sources were set at 400 watts, and the center region was all at 200. So again, being able to balance the power locally 
over each source allows us to get that the tunability of the, of the plasma. Now let's talk about some applications. So the sources, um, you know, were developed and our role in this is really now to say, what can we do to actually um, have some applications that are useful to industry? So one of the areas that we've developed is uh, non-hydrogenated non DLC, diamond like carbon. And the way that we set this up is we've taken one of our high vacuum deposition chambers and we've configured the lid. So we have a, a two inch or a three inch, depending on the lid type, sputter cathode in the center. And then we have four plasma sources surrounding it. So we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna sputter the carbon and then we're gonna generate a plasma through these plasma sources. And, and then we're also going to bias the substrate. So with a DC bias of about 100 volts and a silicon wafer, no additional heating, we can get fairly high quality DLC. I would also mention that for this process, we use these plasma sources prior to deposition to etch the, uh, the native oxide off of the wafer surface. That's really important to get good adhesion, especially when you have a high stress film like DLC. And in this work, we've targeted a film thickness of about 50 nanometers. And so the pictures here on the upper right, you can see this is the lid. Um, there's the sputter source in the center, and then there's the four plasma sources around it. And then here's a, a view through our one of our a viewports, and you can see this is a different configuration. This is actually a three inch sputter cathode and you had two plasma sources, but you can see it's a similar arrangement. And you have the purple plasmas here, which are clearly ionizing the argon in the chamber, and then the sputter cathode in the center. And below is where the substrate will sit. And so um, one thing to look at is really the substrate current as a function of microwave power. And you can see, so here with zero, zero bias in the substrate, we're getting no substrate current, which is expected. But as soon as we put a bias on it, we start to see a, an increase in the substrate current. And then that follows linearly with this, the total microwave power. So it shows you that we are getting additional uh, ion current at the substrate because of that microwave increase. Now, when we combine the two, we start to look at what happens to the film. So in our, in our lab, we are able to measure wafer bow directly. And that's what we use as an initial analysis, initial check on what the process is doing. So I can show you in the upper right corner here, when I look at the compressive film stress of the coating as a function of substrate current, I can, you can see that I'm very clearly changing the, the film stress. Um, and you can find in literature and in our experience, the compressive film stress is a direct, often a direct relation to uh, film hardness. So we did this initially to get an idea of where our process was at. You can see that our best films in this case got up to about 14 gigapa which is quite good for a compressive film stress. And then we were able to send a subset of these to an outside vendor who has a Heizotron uh, tribo indenter. Uh, this is a nano indentation measurement using a diamond Berkovich tip. Um, and then the, the measurement results were done after an average of three indents per sample and they did a very low um, indent load. Because of the thickness of these coatings, we had to be really careful that we were only penetrating into the film surface um, you know, within a, a small amount so that we weren't picking up the substrate. But using this measurement technique, we were able to measure uh, a, na a nano hardness uh, right at around 30 gigapa. Now, unfortunately, by the time this uh, uh, presentation was recorded, I didn't have all the data back. So I've got the, the hardness of 30 gigapa was occurring at about eight and a half gigapa film stress. And clearly I have other coatings here that have gone higher than that. So um, hopefully by the time this presentation airs, I'll have the remaining results in place and we'll see. You know, I put this dashed line here to indicate the trend of the coating quality. And you can see, it looks like it might be plateauing that there may be, you know, may not just keep going up with film stress. So that's an important step for us to figure out. Um, you know, it's some debate here at Malachite about what that looks like and you know it could be that because we're ionizing argon and using that using that as part of the ion assist that we're getting argon incorporation in the film um, which may be leading to this rollover but um, you know data is yet to be presented so hopefully by the time this presentation airs we'll be able to update you and give you that information if not um, you know we can certainly discuss this application um, after the after the meeting 
So that's what we have. So again, serum microwave plasmas can be configured to provide uniform plasma density over large areas, both in a 2D array or in a linear array. And the plasma sources can be used as a, an ion assist mechanism. So we've demonstrated it for diamond-like carbon, but really any sputter film that is you're able to bias the substrate on um, could be used in this technique. So I think there's other application areas that could be explored uh, to improve film quality. Um, the non-hydrogenated DLC films that we produce have gotten to 30 gigapa, and we do think there's a room for further improvement. Um, hopefully in the coming weeks and months, we'll be able to, to publish on that. And um, some of the future experiments we're planning are looking at this sputter plus microwave assist and incorporating uh, additional carbon containing gas. So we've presented in the past where we do a purely CVD process using acetylene and gotten reasonably good quality, reasonably high quality films. But uh, one thing we're interested to see is what happens when you, we combine the two uh, process variables. You know, the idea is it could be that the acetylene gas would incorporate additional carbon ionization, which could help film growth. Um, and also we do have an inline system. So our, we have plans to um, create this inline plasma array uh, and try to and demonstrate this plasma treatment on a, an inline pass-by deposition system. So that'll be coming in the, in the next weeks and months, and hopefully we'll be able to present uh, another update next year at next year's SVC show. So uh, that's all I have today. Thank you for listening. Uh, feel free to reach out if you have any additional questions, and thank you again to uh, all the contributors to this report. So Louie and Fadi at, at Serum, and have David and Robert here at the Malachite team who worked on both the process and the hardware. And um, again, I'll, I'll be here for the Q&A, so please let me know if you have any additional questions. Thank you.